tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami So there's a term in Pali called Yoniso Manasikara, and many of you have probably heard it before. The term Yoniso, uh, well, the term Manasikara is derived from the Pali words manas, which is intellect, and kara, which means action. So it's an action of the intellect. also known or translated into English as attention. And yoniso is derived from the Pali or Sanskrit yoni, which means womb. So this term is uh, translated frequently as appropriate attention or wise attention. And the Buddha singled it out as the most basic mental act which creates kama and creates our world. He, when speaking about the feeding and the starving of good and bad qualities of mind, mind, uh, the bright and dark uh, qualities of the heart, the seven factors of awakening, which include things like mindfulness, energy, faith, and, um, or mindfulness and energy, uh, samadhi, rapture, and the dark qualities of the heart, the hindrances of uh, sensual desire, aversion, drowsiness, restlessness and remorse, sloth and torpor, skeptical doubt. He spoke about appropriate attention as the food by which these qualities were either fed or starved. So I think it's an interesting term, especially the etymological relation to the word for womb, because it's appropriate attention that births our world. And there's a famous line by Hegel where he says that evil lies in the gaze that sees evil all around it. And I remember, um, I've spoken about this moment a few times, but I arrived back in the U.S. on election night last year and found that the headlines people had been checking uh, multiple times every day, every hour, sometimes on their phones. Um, under the sort of, you know, just wanting to stay informed. Although I think that term deserves a lot more skeptical attention in terms of how many times we have to check our phone for that. It had also darkened people's hearts. And although the lives of people I knew day to day were the same in so many ways, imbued with loving, caring relationship with loving people with a wealth of blessings. Although nothing for many had actually changed externally, the world that people inhabited had completely shifted. And I find frequently we forget the bright garden our hands work in for the vague whisper of a serpent. So we see evil in the world, and only evil, and it's easier to see. And so we forget the goodness. In the traditional Buddhist conception, um, the qualities of mind are sometimes parsed out into five different elements. 
which are compared to fingers on the hand in some uh, teachings. So you have the pinky, which is um, feeling. It's very sensitive. You have the thumb, which is attention. You have the pointer finger, which is contact. You have the middle finger, which is intention. And in most cultures, the middle finger is considered the most, it's the longest, it's the most prominent. Our intention drives a lot. And then you have the ring finger, the signet finger, where you bind yourself to another human being, and that's perception. And this quality of perception is interesting here because what we perceive and how we perceive those around us is influences the world we live in, the people we interact with, and where we frequently think we are simply victims to that perception. One of the central Buddhist tenets is that we can use attention to shift perception, to mold it. So, in a sense, when we live in a world of certain perceptions, um, we marry ourselves to that world. When we give our attention to certain things in the world, we birth a world. So what do we want to marry ourselves to? Which kind of world? And what world do we want to bring into being? Because the world we bring into being is also the heart which we bring into being. And this isn't some abstract exercise. It's as simple and as basic and as fundamental as watching the person you've been having an argument with the previous day come into the room or the office or class and either reacting immediately with the mind's natural, say, aversion to that and tightening up or using a strengthened and centered mind to stop and just for a second to feel how your body feels and then to see if you can alter that perception a little bit give attention to the good things that they've done or give attention to other aspects of them such as the reason why they have inherited these traits which might so annoy you What happened in their childhood that made them like that? What part of you has been conditioned that reacts in that way? Is there something in you which you see mirrored in them which you're actually responding to? Because those things which we react to the strongest are usually those dark sides of ourselves that we won't see and won't acknowledge. And this is the act of carefully and intentionally switching our perception and our attention so that we marry ourselves and birth a world which is bright and forgiving and wise instead of one that is reactive, calm, or reactive, agitated, and heated. So there's a book called uh, Buddha Dhamma which is one of the most impressive commentaries of Theravada literature in Thailand. And it's written by a monk named P. A. Piyuto, who I, um, this book is, we once asked Ajahn Pasano what the one book he would go to a desert island with would be, and he said it was this book. And Ajahn Jayasaro said the same, uh, Buddha Dhamma. There's another monk, Buddha Dasa, who said that if he chose a book, it would be a little necklace that said, it's like this if he was on a desert island. I like that answer, but it's not relevant to this talk. (laughs) (laughs) And so it's it's an amazing book, and P.A. Piyuto is an unbelievably humble monk. Ajahn Pasano talks about going off to England in his early years as an abbot of Nanachat, and he was put in charge of this sort of international monastery in northeastern Thailand and had, you know, Eastern Europeans and Western Europeans and Russians and Thais and just all kind of trying to get along and was pretty miserable. 
So he went off to England and the Sangha there was sort of flourishing and things were going smooth. And he went back to Thailand completely dejected. On his way back to the monastery though, he stopped at P.A. Piyuto's monastery in Bangkok. And P.A. Piyuto just lived in this little hut in the back of this sort of busy, kind of unruly monastery with all these other monks. And yet he was the most bright and luminous figure Long Porpasano had almost ever met. And he realized that if this monk could be all right in that circumstance, then he needed to just learn to be all right with where he was. Ajahn Jayasaro, who I stayed with for a oh, time, visited P.A. Piyuto frequently. And he's one of the most famous scholars in Thailand, but he's unbelievably humble. So when I was there, he'd gotten terminal cancer and was being sent to Japan for special treatment by his disciples. And they were trying to schedule his date of uh, treatment, surgery. But his assistant had an exam, uh, a poly exam, and P.A. Piyuta was so concerned about him taking the poly exam that he made them schedule their, his surgery so that his assistant wouldn't miss the poly exam. I thought that was amazing. And in Buddha Dhamma, this book, uh, P.A. Piyuto sort of draws together disparate elements of Dhamma. One of these is a list of the 11, I believe, uses of appropriate attention. It might be 11. So appropriate attention, uh, this list goes, can be used by first contemplating uh, the component parts of something. Second, by contemplating conditionality. Third, by looking at things in terms of the three characteristics of dukkha, anicca, and anatta, suffering, impermanence, and not self. How the world is slipping through our fingers constantly. Fourth, by looking at the world and phenomena in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Fifth, in terms of looking them at the world in terms of Dhamma, principle, and Atta, or purpose. Sixth, in terms of looking at the world in terms of the benefits, the drawbacks, and the escape of any specific mental quality or phenomena. The next, looking at the true and false benefits. The next, in terms of arousing wholesome dhammas. The next, in terms of remaining in the present moment. And the final, using appropriate attention in the context of analytical conversation. So I hope you all remembered all of those. <laughs> I think I got them. This is useful because the defilements become wise to our tricks very quickly. And as practitioners, we don't have the luxury of simply flowing along with our perceptions and the places our attention goes, instinctually. Because the attention goes to the dark things, the burning things. When there's something in your eye, you don't notice anything else. The world is pretty much your eye. And suffering has this quality. The first verse of the Dhammapada says that the mind is the forerunner of all things. Happy, suffering follows the untrained mind, like the wheel of a cart follows the hoof of an ox, where happiness follows the well-trained mind, like a shadow that never leaves. And something people miss in this is the fact that the shadow and happiness are subtle. Our eyes move over them and forget. The ox wheel, or the ox hoof and the cartwheel are heavy. 
they're easy to see. So our attention goes to the argument. It goes to the things that are wrong with our loved ones. It goes to the suffering in our lives. And time and again, we look past the bright, caring qualities and people that hold our lives together. And we don't get to do that as practitioners. Because the more we do it, the more we slip away from that world of blessings. And we exile ourselves from the garden. Eden was never taken from us. We just forget it and look past it. But the defilements want us to remember only the suffering. And as soon as we come up with a tool to shift our attention and mold it and direct it, then the defilements will fight back very quickly. I think this is something we see very clearly in metta practice, is frequently you'll find a phrase in metta practice which works very well for a day. And then the defilements catch on, and after a time it feels like beating your head against a wall, and it doesn't work anymore. So we need an arsenal, a tool belt of means of directing our attention to alleviate suffering. And it doesn't always, it's so frequently described as being as simple as, say, directing your mind to the bright qualities in someone or something, or spreading loving kindness, as if you could just kind of shoot meta rays at people and that you always have those things available. But the Buddha gave us more refined tools than that. And these uses of appropriate attention are those tools, and we have to move through them. So the first use of analyzing things in component parts, you can see this all throughout the teachings, is the Buddha divides the pie in a myriad of ways. He describes the world in terms of refined qualities and discrete pieces. So, for example, the five khandhas, which we've just been speaking about these past few weeks, the aggregates that make up an identity of the body, feelings, perceptions, uh, mental formations, and consciousness. By dividing up an individual into these things, we begin to be able to parse out one from the other. And it's as if we are unwinding a ball of twine which has gotten tangled and when a perception is that large and tangled it's almost impossible to separate out the valence it has acquired of negative or positive so as long as the enemy you know the person we're having an argument with walking in through the door is just that guy then the reaction is almost impossible to avoid in us. But when we analyze that person out into their component parts, when we think about them as a series of programs, uh, some of which Sankara, some of which are from their childhood, uh, some of which are from more recently, about all these different things which compose them, then that concept loses some of its power. When I was going back to the US uh, after being in Thailand and the political situation was so polarized, as it still is, one of the reflections Ajahn Siri Panyo gave me, the first was, you can watch news if you need to, but you don't have the but your responsibility is that you can't let it give rise to even one unwholesome mind state. That's a tall order. <laughs> and yet, it can be done. The second he said is, what is America? It's a, this conglomeration, it's a perception, it's a concept. 
And I found that to be really helpful. If you think about, you know, the decline of America versus, you know, if that's even the narrative you have, versus analyzing it out into all these individuals and places and people, the whole issue loses some of its power over you. And this is what it means to divide out things into component parts. Similarly, dividing out the mind into these qualities of bright and dark, the seven factors of awakening versus the five hindrances. The seven factors of awakening being things like mindfulness, energy, uh, samadhi, that's concentration, equanimity, versus the hindrances of things that keep the mind from stillness, uh, aversion, sensual desire, uh, all the others, is it's as if you're replacing the idea in Ajahn Jeff's word of a city council by looking instead at the individual voices that compose it. And this is so helpful because then when you have the aversive mind state or the bad day or the slip or you yell at the person you shouldn't or snap, it's not you who is bad. It's just one voice of many in you. And we are all a mixture of the animal and the angel. And to be able to know that about yourself and that you aren't damned just because of that is a huge relief. Because we all have our devils and our maras inside of us. And similarly, dividing out the mind into those bright and dark states lets you very carefully learn which ones to strengthen and which ones to starve. How do you feed the brightness in you? And how do you feed it in others? Because if you conceive of those friends and loved ones as just individuals and don't analyze or divide them into the bright and dark in them, then giving someone time and a listening ear is always good and pulling back is always bad. But that's not the case because frequently if you, you know, one very usual experience on the path is losing interest in friends who aren't practicing or interested in the path. And you just don't, you know, it, it's not like you don't, it's not like you seek, cease caring about them, but you aren't as interested in spending time and you maybe are leaning more towards seclusion or spending time with people who do understand. And as monks, we experienced, you know, most of us have experienced this in technicolor detail when we decided to give up all of our old relationships in some sense and move off to a monastery. And people are angry and confused and hurt. Some, at first. But the fact is that People, you know, I've said this before, people don't need another person to go to a coffee date with or a movie. But if you take a step towards the Dhamma with dedication, sincerity, and steadiness, then one day when things do go bad and the cancer diagnosis comes or the divorce happens or suffering really becomes apparent, then they have some reference point in their lives for someone who's taken this path seriously. And that is the biggest gift you can give someone. You're befriending and giving a foundation to the brightest and deepest part of someone, even if on the surface it seems like you're stepping away. In reality, you're stepping towards them. And similarly, you know, someone who say, calls you to vent or to speak one more time about the things that have gone wrong in a way that's not wholesome, you get to realize that just by listening, you're not always feeding a part of them that's going to give them happiness. And you can pull back or you can try to redirect the conversation. So analyzing things into component parts lets, lets us create a world that is refined and where we can act with much more skill because our tools are more, are sharper and more precise.
it's, it's a bit, I think, as if we're surgeons and we've decided to, no, that, that's gonna be a gruesome metaphor, but <laughs> maybe we're woodworkers and instead of just having a hammer, we're sort of refining things down to a small chisel. The second use of appropriate attention is analyzing things in terms of conditionality. And one of the secrets in Buddhism, or one of the secrets that Buddhism reveals to us, is that in Buddhism there's a concept of two arrows. One is the arrow of the world. It's the suffering we all experience from loss, sickness, aging, death, our imperfections, our awkwardness, our stumbling. The second arrow is the one we repeatedly insist on shooting ourselves with, which is where we feel it's wrong that it's like this, where we buy into and feed off of these negative states, where we become drunk on them, where a mildly grumpy mood becomes hatred, where attraction to an object becomes lust and greed. And one of the most effective ways in not shooting us ourselves with that second arrow is to see how things are conditioned. So many of us have this experience of, you know, you see someone in your life who is annoying you or doing things you don't get, and then suddenly you learn what happened to them as a child and how they were affected or abused or hurt. You learn the initiating wound. And then it all makes sense. Then the heart is big enough to hold all the imperfections of the world. And it's not wrong. It's, the heart is wide enough to hold the world in all of its brokenness. But the teaching on conditionality and seeing how things come to be allows it to do just that. In terms of our own neuroses, it's very helpful to see how so many of the things we wish we could let go of came from our childhood. There were ways we survived. There's a reason they came into being. Perhaps we were a part of a large family and the only way we could get attention was to play the clown. Or the only way we could keep peace was to always try to be smoothing things over or the only way we could avoid our father's anger was to hide. And now, 30 or 40 or 50 years later, that same child still hides in us, and it's the states which we know we need to let go of, but we can't. But instead of berating ourselves for being this same flawed person, if we can welcome that child in, see how they were conditioned, see how they helped us survive, and say thank you, Thank you for helping me survive. I don't need you anymore, but thank you. That's a completely different relationship, and it depends on us understanding the conditioned nature of ourselves and our hearts and our world. And of course, this can extend to simple things, like just realizing the reason you're so angry this afternoon is that you drank way too much coffee in the morning. Um, or the reason you're grumpy this morning was because you didn't get enough sleep last night or you haven't eaten. The reason you're afraid is because you're hungry. You haven't, you haven't meditated, this or that. And just how much of a burden that takes off the heart. Just understanding the conditioned nature of the world. The third way of using appropriate attention is to analyze things in terms of the three characteristics of suffering, of not-self, of impermanence. And this can be a very powerful recollection when you're looking at the things in your life which will fade. It's as Ajahn Sona says, we reach into the world which is liquid constantly expecting a solid. And time and again, those things run through our fingers. And 
this can sound like a sort of morbid teaching of Theravada or Buddhism, but what one has to realize is that when all that we're doing is acknowledging the inevitable s movement of those things, and that when we release our little bit of our grip on them, then we can exist in a loving and caring relationship with the world and step deeper and deeper towards a more robust and lasting sense of solidity, refuge, and happiness. There's a wonderful story of Franz Kafka. He found a girl who just lost her doll in the park. And the next day, he wrote a little letter which he left on the girl's doorstep, which was a travel letter from the doll. And over the next few years, every few weeks, there would be a new letter on that girl's doorstep from the doll having traveled to Japan or wherever else in the world. And then at the end of the girl's school um, career, sort of high school before she left, she found a doll on her doorstep and uh, it was you know, come back from traveling, they said, a different doll. And then years later, she found in its hand, hidden, a note from Franz Kafka, which said, you will lose everything you ever loved, everyone you ever loved in your life, but the love will always come back to you in new forms. So yes, when you see the decay of the world, it can seem just like this loss. But the secret is that Buddhism provides us with a transcendent purpose beyond that. And that as long as that veil of things and people and shallow goals transfixes our attention, we will never turn towards the greater brightness hiding just beyond. And in a sense, the whole world is falling apart in its eagerness to show us what lies underneath. And this also isn't just some poetic phrase. It's the process of how, as we begin to practice, you know, maybe we do go out less in the evening and we start going to our rooms and meditating a bit or spending time more and more in one-on-one -on -one and small conversation with people we care about, about things that matter. And every little thing in our lives, which we still can do, we still go to work, we still have relationships, but becomes a means towards the ennoble, ennobling of the heart. So we're letting the veil fall. That's what seeing the three characteristics does. But we don't have to just sit there lamenting the veils falling. Instead, we can rejoice at the face that it slowly reveals. And this is the beauty of the path. Of the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. That's our refuge. And it seems like it happens slowly at first, but it's actually a very quick progression towards these brighter states in the mind. Ajahn Sona says that if you practice with dedication for five years, then you can expect your, ha your suffering to be reduced by 50%. I think that's a valid metric, actually. The next use of appropriate attention, which might be the last one that we have time for, is seeing everything in terms of the Four Noble Truths. And the Buddha gave two categorical teachings, which can be used in any situation. And these are the Four Right Efforts and the Four Noble Truths. So the Four Noble Truths are very problematically and over, sometimes they're translated just as, this is, there is suffering, there is the cause of suffering, the release and the path. But it's very important to remember the duties that the Buddha gave for each of the truths. We comprehend suffering. We let go of the craving that gives rise to it. We realize the peace of the path, and we develop the path. 
or we realize the peace of cessation and develop the path. And this is an extremely powerful use of appropriate attention because it's always there. And the beauty of the Buddha's teaching centering around the aspect of dukkha or stress and suffering, it's not terribly romantic, but instead of focusing and centering the teaching around sort of the ideal of a transcendent, uh, sort of a god or something like this, is that we just don't always have access to that. We aren't always in states of divine bliss, which is a, just a problem. But dukkha is always there in some sense. We always have that to work with. And it's that wound that binds us together also with all humanity. Is you can always touch and relate to someone at the deepest level of our shared vulnerability and pain. So, in a sense, the Four Noble Truths comprise the essential switch in our orientation to the world. Because there's no neutral stance towards suffering. We're either running from it or we're turning carefully and intentionally towards it to lay our hands on it and understand its shape and suffering so that we can let go of the causes of that. Um, there's a story of a teacher in Idaho who, when he was talking about the first noble truth, comprehending suffering, uh, a person in the audience said, that's oh, like telephone poles. And he said, what do you mean? And the person said, well, I used to work installing telephone poles. And the foreman said, if this falls, which way do you run? And I said, you run away. But the foreman said, no, if this pole falls, you get right up next to it and put your hands on it so you feel which way it's going. And has anyone seen my octopus teacher? So yeah, a person who watched this recently pointed out that when the octopus jumps on the shark's back, it's a bit like the first noble truth. I think that's a good one. Well done, Allison. <laughs> So, and this is beautiful because when we find the suffering in another person or ourselves, you know, it's not always the case that we can just replace that perception with one of brightness, and it would be wrong to do so in every situation. We can't always just convince ourselves that this person, you know, just bring to mind the bright qualities in the person or convince ourselves that there's blessings that we aren't seeing. Sometimes we have to go through that dark valley first. Sometimes we have to really touch our own suffering and acknowledge it. And this is, you know, why we have to be quick on our feet with metta practice. Is so often we want to spread metta to people around us. But frequently what we actually have to do is just turn our attention back to ourselves and feel our own suffering first. And just acknowledge it and hold it. Because until we've done that, Everything else is spiritual bypass. And also, touching that first noble truth of suffering externally allows us to have compassion where we wouldn't otherwise. Because frequently that initiating wound is what gives rise to all unwholesomeness. So you see the political anger in the world and in the US, say? And can you trace it back to the fear and the discontent and the poverty and the hunger that is giving rise to that reaction? Because there's compassion there. So when my teacher said that I could watch the news but couldn't let even one unwholesome mind state arise, that didn't just mean pretend everything is rosy. It meant, can you use all these means of appropriate attention to do things like analyze America in terms of its component parts or someone else in terms of their component parts? Can you see how it's conditioned? Can you see the suffering that gave rise to that negative negativity? Can you see the impermanence of it all? 
and step towards a wider and more transcendent pattern in your life and in that world. And little by little, if we do this, we're finding our way back to the garden. We are slowly realizing that within the dark and the bright of our world, we can maneuver appropriate attention, yoniso manasikara, and shape it and be intentional with it and create a mind and a heart and a world which are bright and full of blessings. And sometimes that comes from raising up the bright qualities and sometimes it comes from diving right into the dark ones and seeing through them and understanding them. And it takes a while to figure out when to do which, especially since there's a good nine other items on this list which we don't have time to talk about today. So we'll save that for next week. And I think that uh, one of the beauties of appropriate attention um, is that yes, we marry ourselves to a world through our acts of perception, but the chance to step into a community that's seeing each other and holding and supporting each other in that constant effort towards spiritual awakening is a great gift. And it's not what everyone does with their Saturday mornings. So thank you all and a special Thank you to the people who drove all the way from Olympia. So, sorry.